When you think of Google, you might think about how they know your every move and thought and sell your data for millions of dollars to advertisers so I can make money off of your view. But then you think about all their amazing products that we take for granted on a daily basis, like YouTube and Google and Gmail. Seriously, have you ever tried Bing or Dailymotion or Outlook? But then the third item on your mental list might be all the silly products that Google tried bringing into the world, but then resulted in failure and everyone forgot about. Like Google Answers. You remember this? I barely do. It unlocked a memory I didn't know I had, like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I vaguely remember Google Answers and several other failed Google products from the early 2000s, and even more recent ones like Stadia. Don't worry, I'll go over that one because it also lives in my brain like a mythical creature that you hear about but aren't really sure if it really exists and not really sure what it does. People make fun of Google and their failed products and not to defend a multi-billion dollar corporation, I just think it's an interesting thing for people to see how businesses come to thrive. Tons and tons of failed ideas before one finally pops off. So when Google does this in the public eye, I find it interesting to follow the breadcrumbs of ideas that eventually became other ideas of more successful Google products that I found while looking into this video, and we'll see just that. But also, it's not that deep. Let's make fun of some wacky sh But before we get into Google Answers, let me answer your question about online privacy. When you were a kid, you probably put a ton of your information on some of these websites that we're going to cover in this video, because who knew about online privacy in 2008? Not me. That information gets put on a ton of data broker websites because it's public. And now you're wondering how in the world they know your childhood address, your phone numbers, and every email you've ever had. Well, that's where the sponsor of today's video, Aura, comes in. Aura is an online privacy tool that can take your information off of data broker websites automatically, which would take you ages to do yourself. These sites don't make it easy to remove your personal information. And if you've tried, like me, you know, because they profit off of your information. They don't want you to get rid of it. So Aura will remove that for you you and they have a built-in VPN and password manager. They look out for breached passwords and will notify you if your information is being used by someone that's not you. Like if someone's trying to take out a bank or a car loan in your name, you will be the first to know. It's an all-in-one tool so you're not paying for seven different services. And you can use my link in the description, aura.com slash gabbybell, or scan the QR code on the screen to get 14 days free and let Aura do the hard work of protecting your information online. And also just stop Stop putting your personal information everywhere, that would help too. But if it's already out there, and chances are it probably is, use Aura. Thanks to Aura for sponsoring this video, and Google Answers! Google Answers was basically Reddit with a paywall. Really interesting concept. So it allowed users to ask any question they wanted and set a price they were willing to pay for that answer. Then certified researchers could answer the question to receive payment. This is so interesting to consider and I can see how something like this would be a good idea on paper to pay to get answers from an expert instead of a bunch of random internet users. But was there a way to actually vet this? And not enough people were willing to pay. Except for this guy in the relationship and society category who's willing to fork over $30 to anyone who can answer how diversity is managed in French. How diversity is managed in French? Which model? And the strengths and weakness of this model. And I want to get the answer as quick as possible. There was no answer to this question. No one was willing to help this guy out for $30. I wonder why. It's like free money at that point. Just say literally anything. So Google Answers website is still up and you can see the archive and it's a treasure trove of content and I might go dumpster diving for a future video. Or this guy who was willing to put up two cold hard dollars to ask, what is the best software to unzip files? Well, a good decade and a half later and I can confidently tell you that I still have a trial for WinRAR and it works great. I might consider buying it when my trial ends in another 20 years. So as you can see, it's pretty obvious why Google Answers got shut down when people were literally spending their free time answering questions for free on sites like Yahoo Answers, Ask Jeeves, that one's a deep cut, and Reddit was also popping up at the same time. Google Plus was recent enough that I'm sure most of you have at least heard of it. It was a weird social media. Remember when Google tried to force everyone to have a Google Plus account in order to comment on YouTube? That was terrible. <laughs> I gave it an honest go back in like 2012 and was so confused on how to use it and like what circles were. I wasn't sure what they were, how to make or join them. Granted, this was an era in which Instagram was starting to get popular in like 2012. So the concept of social media was extremely new 
new to me. It was a time where I'd post square pictures of Blink-182 on Instagram. All I remember about Google Plus was that it was extremely confusing to use, and the integrations across Google products didn't make a ton of sense to me as a dumb kid. If you try to visit plus.google.com today, you just see this memorial page for Google Plus saying it's shut down with no proper explanation on why. It's pretty clear that it was not living up to the high, high standard of social media. Um. See fairies allowed? No. I mean, at the time, it fell heavily behind Facebook, even, in popularity. <laughs> So this is pre-YouTube YouTube. A video sharing website to upload your submission tape to America's Funniest Home Videos, which by the way, the whole show I never understood or liked as a kid, because it was solely videos of people getting hurt. The best comedy of the early 2000s, I suppose. Google bought YouTube in 2006, just a year after Google Video launched, but I'm shocked they kept the pulse on Google Video for as long as they did until they shut it down in 2009. But after Google bought YouTube, the a key difference that they started to make was that Google video search results would start to include videos discovered by their web crawlers on things other than YouTube. So it kind of morphed into what Google videos is today, where if you search something, you can sort by videos and look at it that way. That's what Google video has become. As far as I've read, there wasn't anything blatantly wrong with Google video, but since they bought YouTube a year after launching Google video, and with literally no one using Google video and everyone was using YouTube, there was just no need to continue to spend the resources to keep Google video alive. I guess they probably wanted a few buffer years. In case YouTube didn't work out, they would still have Google video. But here it is, panning out. You're here. Hey. The year is 2014. Gas prices are $300 a gallon, but you have $30 in your bank account. Taylor Swift drops 1989 and blank space is nonstop on the radio. Everyone at school is talking about Ebola and the missing Malaysian Airlines flight, and Google Glass drops to the public and everyone is making fun of it. At the time, we didn't have good VR headsets or Beat Saber to play with them. I love Beat Saber. We were still looking for that new tech after the whole world started adopting smartphones as breakthrough handheld technology, of course after the DS, and Google Glass was supposed to answer that need as high-tech, AR-inspired futuristic glasses. Except it apparently didn't do anything well. According to this article, it didn't do a single action especially well. If you even had one, of course, because it dropped at a hot $1,500. So people were like, why would I buy that when I can spend the same money on an iPhone or other luxury item that actually works? I guess it was supposed to show information on screen, like emails, location-based helpful information, and things like that, but I don't know about you, but if I had spent $1,500 on a device, Device that was gonna show me emails and Twitter notifications within my field of view at all times of the day, it would drive me insane. Actually, it wouldn't even be all day because the battery life was supposedly three to five hours. And then you're back to your regular loser glasses for the rest of the day. I was shocked to find upon visiting the Google Glass website that they had only discontinued Google Glass in 2023. Who was buying this thing? Well, I found someone who had and used these and actually this function is kind of sick. I was able to capture video while not having to do anything with my hands. I didn't have to hold a phone up and make that. I'm staring at the phone instead of staring at my kids. I love the fact that I can have a camera right here recording great moments all the time. That's actually pretty cool. On the contrary, it also brought up a lot of issues and concern about privacy because if you're wearing these homunculus glasses in public, first of all, they look goofy, so people didn't want them for that reason. But then also there's a privacy concern when you're wearing literally a camera everywhere you go filming people in public, places that do not want to be filmed. I personally hate when I'm in someone's picture, like in the background, so I would hate having someone walk around with a video camera attached to their face without you knowing if they're recording or not. So all that plus the price tag, Google Glass was not gonna get picked up by the public. 
Google Stadia was one of those things that I had always been hearing about, but never fully looked into it or understood. It was always kind of a passing fart in the back of my mind, never really leaving purgatory or finding peace. Google Stadia was Google's gaming console. Console. Which, following theme with other Google products, interesting and innovative concept that didn't work very well and maybe was ahead of its time given the technological capabilities at its release. So it was supposed to be a cloud streaming gaming console where you could stream the games you play. We've seen other concepts like this, but they never really ended up working out. My sister actually had one of these and said it was really laggy and glitchy, and she ended up paying more to just buy a PS4 instead. But if you dig for actual customer reviews, it was really inconsistent in game quality. They advertised that it could run at 4K 60 FPS of your favorite games, but it was shoddy and inconsistent at best. Lots of people saying AAA titles couldn't run at 60 FPS FPS without turning the game onto potato mode. If you didn't have perfect internet 100% of the time, you just couldn't play anything well. Putting all the processing on Stadia's server side would rely on your connection quality. You're putting an extra layer of connection in between you and the game, which is going to cause problems in something so hypersensitive to input lag and connection like gaming. For just $100 more, for more consistent and a controlled way to play, going with a real console was just just a better option for most people. And games don't have to run at 4K 60 FPS, it's more that this was just what was promised and it didn't work as advertised, which leads to people feeling cheated by a cheap product. Plus, you still had to buy it and pay for a monthly subscription service to access their library of free games, and you had to still pay full price for games that you didn't actually own because you're just streaming it, you're just paying to access it. You do not own the game. So over time, it just ended up being still a better option Option to just get an actual console. Semi-unrelated, but Diablo 4 literally is unplayable on the PS5, and I'm paying too much to my ISP to get one gigabyte down. Like, the technology is not there. Why does Diablo 4 need to be connected to the internet for me to play a single-player game? With no option to play offline. It's a single-player f game, and the couch co-op was even worse. And you have to make another account and log into three different things. Plus, it's an MMORPG. They figured out online capabilities for this technology two decades ago. I had to log into like three different services to play a single player game that didn't even work for $70. <laughs> And yes, I re-downloaded everything, reconnected to my internet, restarted my internet, I, I did the works, okay? And until as a society, we can get this shit working the way it's supposed to, something like Stadia is not going to work. If MapleStory and RuneScape did it like 20 years ago, I'm pretty sure in 2023, Blizzard can figure it out. Anyway, the Stadia was $129 at its release, so it was meant to be more accessible and affordable. But they had promised a bunch of features that were abandoned, like developing their own in-house titles, but just like I said, streaming games is just not an option unless you can do it really, 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 really well. We've seen Nintendo. They cannot figure out how to how to do online for the life of them. And lots of gamers are just looking for offline, non-laggy experiences where we have physical control over our game copies, which is why tons of gamers still buy physical versions of their games. Anyway, that was more of a rant about my recent gaming experiences. Like for me to play Fall Guys with my friends, I had to re-log into my Nintendo account twice for some reason, and then also link it to my Epic Games account just for me to get on, so it, it, it took like 30 minutes for me to even start playing with my friends. I just don't like how we have to log in to seven things to play something now. My boomer takes aside Stadia shut down in January of 2023, and I think it's pretty clear why. It couldn't do the one thing it was designed to do very well. This one I had never heard about, but it was just too goofy not to include when researching this video. Google Lively was Google's take on Second Life. And as you could tell from the transition, it only existed in 2008, which explains why I never knew about it. It was only live from July to December of 2008. This shit looks like a Flash game with random assets that definitely weren't drawn by the same people. None of this is cohesive. But it was a browser-based game. This is essentially the metaverse, but 15 years ago. And it 
doesn't look like the technology improved very much by these big companies. I don't know how we've evolved to have such amazing new hardware, but something like an MMORPG by Google and Meta can't be done in a normal working state. They had about 10,000 active users when Google shut it down in December. They pulled the plug on this and Stadia like a Netflix show that wasn't making enough millions of dollars to bother to keep funding. If it's not number one, it's not good enough, and we don't care to spend resources investing and improving in it so people will actually use it. But they shut it down to focus on other things like search tools and ad solutions. Things that make way more money. <laughs> I mean, look at these graphics, they're so good. This is so silly, and I know this was trying to compete with the likes of other online avatar-based MMOs like Habo Hotel, Club Penguin, IMVU, Gaia Online, and Second Life, but I don't think they marketed it very well or at all. Because judging by the comments, people actually really liked Google Lively. I hope they ended up finding a new home though. I didn't cover nearly the total amount of failed Google products. I just picked out a few that I personally remembered using or hearing about. There are plenty more and plenty more details that I didn't cover, but I still hope you learned something new or I took you on a trip to memory lane to see the sites. Thank you to my patrons and follow me on Instagram at itsgabbybell and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.